Oh. Hi, you guys. We love that song. Turn it up loud. It's fabulous. Greetings. Welcome, everybody, to a conference about, about, about software, I guess. Uh, I was really excited about this. I was until just a couple minutes ago. Um, somebody came up to me and said, uh, is Bill Nye your real name? And I said, well, uh, it's William Nye. And he said, well, why did you change it? <laughs> well, <clears throat> we'll be here for a while, I guess. Uh, 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 hi, greetings, everyone. Uh, this antenna is real. It monitors uh, spacecraft. It's in um, the Czech Republic. But it looks, <laughs> it looks like a cartoon, but it's the real thing. And it's from a time when uh, people designed antennas just with brute strength, and, and it works. Now, uh, as you may know, uh, I, I, as uh, Jim said, I started out at Boeing. This is the, uh, the Dash 80. Well, actually, it's a picture of the Dash 80. The, the plane itself is quite a bit bigger, and uh, it's three-dimensional, just if you haven't uh, seen it. Anyway, uh, today, uh, it's very fashionable to have things in what I call the Seahawks colors, Seattle Seahawks, this uh, green and blue. I like it, it's good. Uh, but in those days, the colors that were trendy were yellow and brown. And, um, and uh, so they made the very first 707 uh, yellow and brown. And for those of you who don't know, uh, this, is, this plane flew, this particular plane flew before the 707, the 727, 3747 designations were invented. Now, if you've never, and I'm just going to say, I have tremendous loyalty to Boeing because of their tremendous diligence in the engineering, in their engineering. Their tremendous care they took on, at every step of the way, every rivet, literally, uh, is uh, held to a very high standard. So if you've never seen this film, it is big, stupid fun. This is the Dash 80 in 1954, flying over what's called uh, Sea Fair, the Seattle Fair, which they have every summer. And here it's flown by a guy named Tex Johnston. I don't know if you've ever been in an airliner when they do this. They go uphill a little bit and then do what's called a barrel roll. I don't know how much flying you've done, but they don't generally do that with airliners. <laughs> and he, he landed the plane, and Boeing management expressed concern. <laughs> uh, and there's a famous picture there of the airplane. Now, I don't know how, how quickly you've noticed this, but in this picture, it looks like you're looking out the window of a plane that you've been on, but notice that it's upside down. And this picture was taken by uh, the flight engineer. This is back when airliners had three people, three, two pilots and an engineer. And so Boeing management expressed concern, you know, uh, uh, Tex. And, they, and by the way, Tex Johnson, of course, he was a contemporary of Chuck Yeager. And so he affected that, you know, down holler. I'm just going to fly this old plane, and I, they don't know what they're these engineers. They don't know what they're doing. So he lands the plane. There's a press conference, <clears throat> and you guys, this is before everybody had a camera, and there was always a camera. So it's it's part of Boeing lore. Uh, they said, you know, Tex, what are you doing? And the first thing he said is, I'm selling airplanes. And then. <laughs> And then he's supposed to have said, one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. And that, my friend, those are words to live by, people. And especially to me in the software world. Well, we haven't, I mean, it's beta. Uh, it should work. <laughs> the word should, I just, as an engineer, I just really caution you on that. The plane should be able to roll over, it should be. And uh, I don't know if you're into this, it's big fun, but he's supposed to have executed what's called a ballistic roll, where you maintain positive Gs all the way over. It didn't spill the coffee. Uh, it's probably true. Uh, anyway, I worked at Boeing on 747s. Don't worry, 
everybody. I was very well supervised. And uh, one day, one month, there was a big concern for the, the uh, 747 that later became Air Force One. There's a vibration in the yoke, in the steering wheel. And uh, we, they, it's the thing they give to the young guy because you still do math. And uh, we, we fixed it. We got, it, got rid of it. But last year, I had the extraordinary uh, opportunity to be right up close to Air Force One. It's the same plane. The thing is 40 years old, and they polish it every day. They do. Your tax dollars at work, and it still flies. And they're talking about how they're having trouble getting the instruments because they're, the stuff's 40 years old, and the cockpit's been replaced. All the um, old instruments are being replaced with so-called glass cockpit. But it was cool to see the thing still flying. It's a venerable aircraft. And the reason it's still flying is because it was well designed, because it was well made. The guy I worked for was brilliant. He was just a very good engineer, very diligent guy, just made sure everything worked. Always thinking steps and steps ahead. Always worried about failure modes and effects. Uh, FEMA analysis. Uh, but I came of age, everybody, when this wasn't true of everything. For those of you, <laughs> who may recognize this vehicle. This is a Ford Pinto, a fine, handsome vehicle in a sense. It had curved metal doors, which was just this new thing to get doors to curve enough and, not, uh, and be manufacturable. But you may know that this vehicle had this huge, serious problem. And uh, this is a drawing that appeared in a few articles, and it's about the design defects of the Ford fuel tank system the Pinto fuel tank system. Did anybody, is anybody of an age where you had a Ford Pinto? Yes, right on, and you're here. That's good, because they had an issue. Uh, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. But if the car gets re got rear-ended, fuel would spill onto the hot exhaust pipe and often burst into flames. And this is where uh, they, this is a problem they could have avoided. And this cynical woman put, keep off my rear, I'm explosive. And uh, that other um, flame is from a test that was done to show that this real, was a real problem. Now, I, just some disclosure, everybody. I have an attorney, okay? I, have, I guess I have a couple attorneys. And they are of great value, uh, especially when it comes to uh, intellectual property. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, uh, not here. Uh, but uh, if you don't know this, they did this analysis where they figured that the cost of fixing the fuel tank system where the, hot, where the gas could fall onto the hot exhaust pipe was much more than the price of just paying the legal uh, lawsuits associated with whatever went wrong. So they did not make this design change, and reports vary, but it was, about, it was less than $10 a car. Depends how you estimate. And $10, I mean, in 1980, $10 was like $100 a car. So uh, it was generally agreed that was not a good decision. But my claim is you can avoid it if you take time at the one place nobody wants to take time. So this is an example from my life. Uh, I call this the up to side down pyramid of design because it looks like a pyramid upside down. That's where I got the idea for the name. <laughs> and at the bottom of the upside down pyramid is the design. This is what the car is going to look like or the fabric of the software or whatever it is. It's, it's what you're going to do. And generally, they're the fewest number of people involved at the bottom of the pyramid. It's generally of the upside down pyramid. That's generally where they're the fewest number of people doing anything. Modern car might have fewer than 50 people doing the design of something that's going to cost, it's going to be, uh, they're going to invest millions and millions of dollars hoping to make back m a few more millions and millions of dollars. But the thing is, nobody wants to spend time there. At least nobody I worked for. Let's go, let's go, let's get it done. Come on, ship it, let's go, go, go. We'll sort it out later. 
But that's uh, after you have the design, at least in automobile manufacturing or airplanes, then you have these guys called material planning. Somebody's got to order all the steel or the aluminum or the titanium. Somebody's got to order the adhesives, the lacquer, the corrosion resistant grease. You got to order all that stuff. And then in the case of cars, eventually you start putting this material together and you will weld it and paint it. And then eventually up there at the top is this mythic thing called marketing. I don't know what goes on there, but that's where the most money is spent. Uh, and so I just point out to everybody that the difference between a Ford Pinto and an Audi A4 is not that great. They're made of the same stuff. The Mazda Miata was a contemporary, very successful vehicle. They're made of the same thing. They have tires, they have windshield wipers, they have windshield wiper motors, they've got windshield wiper washer squirter pumps. They're pretty much the same, the upholstery is the same. Certainly the techniques for assembling them are very similar. But my claim is you can have the greatest welders in the world come to work and sing the I want to weld a car today song. And the painters, the car painters come and they're doing calisthenics to get excited to paint the cars. But if what you start with is the design of a Ford Pinto, on your very best day, when everything goes perfectly, on Tuesday morning is actually the best day for manufacturing, by the way. Welcome. Uh, I hope you're feeling it. On your very best day, all you're going to get is a Ford Pinto. And uh, this issue has haunted me my whole life. So I tell everybody, we've got to spend time with the design. Everybody wants to go right in production or right into shipping or right into publishing or, uh, or posting on the web. Everybody just wants to get going. But as I say, good engineering invites right use. Just if you have something that people can figure out, they will use it. Now, uh, you know how much I love you all, more than life itself. Yes, I love you all more than life itself. But how many of you have taken out your phone and turned it off instead of taking a picture? Most of us, right? So that's an avoidable engineering problem, I claim. Now, with that said, you guys are working in this very exciting area, and to me, just essential area, area to the future, uh, essential technologies to humankind's future. And uh, I want everybody to do the highest quality job they can in everything we do, because, in my opinion, humankind is facing a very serious problem that we've hardly begun to address. 2015 was the hottest year on record, warmest year on record. Uh, for those of you who follow the tweets, uh, this, uh, the first quarter was the hottest quarter on record. 2016 is, is off to the hottest year on record. If you're scoring along with us, 2016 will probably not be quite as hot as 2015 because the El Nino in the Pacific Ocean is calming down. So 2016 will be warm, but probably not quite as warm as 2015. That doesn't mean we don't have an issue, everybody. <laughs> it means we've got to pay attention to the future. Now, uh, I've spent some time you know, working against climate change deniers, but let me just say, the reason the world's climate is changing is twofold. Um, the first reason is what I call reason uh, number one. No, I came up with that. That's, yeah, I did. And if you look at the Earth from space, this is the International Space Station. Actually, it's a picture, once again, it's a picture of the International Space Station. I know it's all about virtual reality, but this, it's, uh, the International Space Station is bigger than that. Um, anyway, it looks like the Earth's out of focus, but that's, it's not out of focus. That's it, that's all the atmosphere we have. That's it, if we had some extraordinary car, a ladder car that could drive straight up on some extraordinary ladder road, 
we'd be in outer space in an hour. Well, driving here would be two hours, but uh, you'd be above the breathable part of the atmosphere in five minutes. That's it. That's all the air we have. And so uh, when you think of the atmosphere as being this giant thing, it is big, but it's not that big. And then the other problem, what I call reason number two, is uh, the human population. When I was nine years old, my family took me to the World's Fair in New York, New York. The town's so nice, they named it twice. And the United Nations had a totalizer board, a tote board of the world's, uh, estimated world's human population. And we had just missed it. My family and I had just missed it uh, changing from 2,999,999,999 people in the world to 3 billion people. It was in 1965. Well, as of this morning, on the electronic uh, internet that the kids are all using, uh, the world's population is over 7.3 billion people. 7.3 billion from 3 billion. It's more than doubled in my lifetime. And I mean, I'm pretty old, but I'm not that old. And that's it, you guys. The Earth's atmosphere is fantastically thin, and there's 7.3 billion of us trying to breathe it and burn it. And that's why the world's climate's changing. I mean, humans are going nuts. And don't get me wrong, some of my best friends are humans. Uh, and then, of course, there was my old boss. I was never sure if he was uh, one of us. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, it, is, it is the most important problem humankind's face. This doesn't mean we don't, don't need to address terrorism. Doesn't mean we don't have to provide aid to people in Ecuador where this devastating earthquake just happened. It doesn't mean we don't have to get people out of the floods in Texas this morning. It just means we've got to get to work. Now, you may know there are a lot of climate change deniers especially in the United States. They're more in the United States than anywhere. And they have been very successful in keeping the United States from getting going. And I don't know if you know this guy, it's Ken Ham. He has a, a ministry in Kentucky and he really encourages everybody to not believe in climate change. Oh, but he is not alone. I'm proud to say that Sarah Palin mentioned me the other day uh, she's a climate change denier. Uh, Marsha Blackburn from coal country in Tennessee, big denier. Uh, Scott Walker from Wisconsin will not answer any questions about climate change. He will not admit to not believing in evolution. He just says, I won't talk about it. Then I don't know if you know James Inhofe. He's a charming guy who found a snowball and thought that proved somehow that the world wasn't warming. And he's a real guy. He's a U.S. Senator from the venerable state of Oklahoma, capital Oklahoma City. And then Florida Governor Rick Scott is an amazing guy. He will not permit his staff to say the phrase climate change in a meeting. Meanwhile, the engineer of Miami Beach, I don't know if you're into this, but there's two cities. There's Miami and Miami Beach. Miami is a lot of low income people. Miami Beach has a lot of very high income people. And so city engineer Bruce Mowry has managed to make it so there's an ordinance, I mean a building code, that you have to be able to raise the electrical outlets and light switches twice over the next 30 years when you re-pour, that's a verb, the cement floor of your business in, this, in these couple of neighborhoods that flood all the time. So the city engineer is doing this to address climate change, but the governor won't let him say that he's doing it. And I'm very proud to say this morning, uh, Jim had me um, autograph a copy of my book, Unstoppable, to Sarah Palin. Uh, despite your efforts, let's be unstoppable. And let me just say, Earth Day is on Friday. There are 20 books in a carton. They make great gifts. I'm here for you. Uh, Cinco de Mayo is coming up. You know, and then after that, the solstice. It's just very exciting. A lot of gift opportunities. But Jim had me sign this to Sarah, despite your efforts, let's be unstoppable. So I don't know if you heard about this, but this guy, Ken Ham, is the same guy 
that I debated about evolution in Kentucky two years ago. And as of this morning, it's had almost 5.3 million views. So you're telling me, you're telling me that there's 5.3 million people who think, who don't understand the fundamental idea in all of life science? I would say it's at least that many. That's the official number. It's probably four times that high. You guys are in software. But don't worry, the next morning after this debate, somebody from, this is Tennessee license plate, but it's right across the border. Um, <clears throat> Bill Nye, the science lie. Yes, if only Bill Nye weren't here, things would be fine. We wouldn't need to worry about this. But this uh, idea that we have such a, an illiterate, scientifically illiterate fraction of our population is very troubling. And uh, Carl Sagan used to talk about this, uh, that we can't, have, we can't have a large segment of our society that doesn't understand how our society operates. I mean, uh, I, uh, I had downloaded my boarding pass in the green room a few minutes ago. How many people, how many text messages have you checked since we got here? You know, a dozen. This, uh, go to the cash machine, everything depends. Uh, airline schedules, uh, shipping, everything depends on, on the internet and uh, software. And so we have to have as many people in our society as possible to be aware of uh, the process of science and how we know nature and to uh, somebody, someplace, is going to have to address climate change. And by somebody, someplace, I mean somebody in leadership. Now look, you guys, I am not here advocating any presidential candidate by any means. But just notice that right now, on the conservative side, all three of the people still in the race are deniers. And I just claim that if we end up in it with a situation or one of the deniers ends up in the most powerful, becomes the most influential person on earth, the US president, where it's gonna be really hard for a lot of humankind to have a high quality of life. The ocean's getting bigger, because it's getting warmer. Oh, by the way, uh, NASA reported this morning that the ocean is warmer than ever, this first quarter of 2016. So uh, don't be surprised also, I will not be surprised also, after the, uh, Republican convention, and they do pick somebody or a pair of people, don't, I won't be surprised at all if that person says, well, yeah, I've been thinking about it, and climate change is a serious issue, and we're going to address it. Because apparently there are enough Republicans in the Congress, in Senate, and uh, House of Representatives that are going to hold hands, as the saying goes, and address climate change. It's just in order to get the nomination on the conservative side, you have to be so hard over on this that... Um, that uh, they presented themselves as uh, abject deniers. Now, uh, just to, some more about me. Uh, I uh, interviewed or got interviewed by a guy named Mark Morano, who is a big climate denier, and he has a company. You can check out their 990s. Uh, and Joe Bastardi, who's a big denier, he's a meteorologist. You can, they get their money from the fossil fuel industry that's how they are paid. And they have been really successful at introducing this idea that scientific uncertainty, plus or minus a couple percent, is the same as plus or minus 100 percent about doubt about the whole thing. And I don't know if you get into this, but the New York Times found these documents last October where Exxon had a bunch of scientists. This is before it was Exxon Mobil. Exxon Mobil had a bunch of scientists who said, hey, you know, if we keep this up, the world's going to be in a lot of trouble. And those people were all dismissed from the company. And I remember doing a job for Exxon in 1994, and those executives were talking about the wind industry and whether or not Exxon was going to stay involved. They made lubricants for the wind turbines, apparently. But the whole thing comes down to, uh, I can't help but think of this quotation from Upton Sinclair. <laughs> said, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on his not understanding it. And that uh, really has been a serious problem. And I know it's easy in California for us to dismiss this as just sort of a fringe thing. But notice the United States has had a lot of trouble leading the world in uh, new technologies uh, to address climate change, many, many, many of which are based on crowdsourcing of open source software. So uh, the, the thing is, this has real costs. 
There was flooding in Texas this morning. People can't go back to their houses. I don't know if you've ever had flooding in your house. Everything is ruined. Your furniture's ruined, your refrigerator's ruined, your food is spoiled, your sheets and towels are ruined, everything you own is ruined, and it's just, it's a total drag. And often your house has to be rebuilt in some fashion because of this mold that's so common. So this has real costs. When we, dis when we dispatch uh, emergency services people, this is, we're paying for it. So I w the sooner we get to work on this, the better. Now, everybody here was alive for this trauma of 9-11, where the United States was just in horror, or the world was just in horror that uh, the United States could get attacked by these strange people with different views, using our own technology against us, in a sense. I uh, took this picture. I was flying over New York this year. Well, I, I mean, I was in an airplane. I wasn't, I'm not just, I'm not like that. And it's really striking, these, these twin beams. Uh, representing the Twin Towers. And this was a crisis, and the United States addressed it. We now have the, for better or for worse, we have the Transportation Security Agency. You may not like going through the line, but it beats having all air travel shut down and 3,000 of our fellow citizens uh, killed in a horrible fashion. And uh, this is not the first time the United States has been through this. And so uh, I just remind us that we, are, we can accomplish great things. This is, uh, uh, these are my parents. Well, actually, it's a picture of my parents. Uh, they weren't that big. Uh, and they were, in, when I knew them, they were in color and uh, three-dimensional. Uh, no, they were. Uh, what, would you, what would we be doing if we weren't here this morning? We'd be watching reruns of uh, CSI uh, Fruitvale or something. Do they have that yet? Do they have that? It's coming. CSI Oakland, I know, is in the works. Anyway, I hope you can infer that my dad went to Johns Hopkins. I hope you can get that. Uh, but he, her father would not let them get married until she was graduated from college. It was very traditional. He was a few years, a couple years older than she was. So he took this job on Wake Island in the Pacific Ocean. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. You go to Hawaii, and then you go, uh, if, you were, if you were a business person doing business in Asia, you would fly from San Francisco Bay on a seaplane to Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, refuel, then you'd fly to Wake Island and refuel there. You couldn't get to Shanghai or Asia without stopping at Wake Island, this little atoll in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So my dad took a job there, and it was a cool job in the summer of 1941. But it wasn't such a cool job in December of 1941. So uh, Pearl Harbor was bombed on December 7th. So was Wake Island. But because the international dateline was December 8th. Anyway, my dad and his comrades fought back for two weeks. But they were captured on Christmas Eve 1941. And my dad ended up a prisoner of war, uh, Japanese military. They controlled China for a while, northern China, and then later in the war, South Island of Japan. If you guys get a chance to be prisoners of war, I would not do it. <laughs> I would not do it. It sounds like it really kind of sucked, even on the best day. It was not the thing. Meanwhile, my mom was graduated from Goucher College. This is in the different days, the dean of students at Goucher was Dorothy Stimson, who was the first cousin of Henry Stimson, who was the Secretary of War. This is back when it was called the Department of War, before it was called the Department of Defense. And uh, she, he said to her, do you have any women that can come work on this thing? I can't what, tell you what it is. So my mom and several other gals from her graduating class were recruited to work on the Enigma Code this crazy, famous, notorious German code. And look, everybody, I'm not, look, I'm not being a bad person here. I'm just, I'm just talking about uh, World War II. Really, everybody, looking at this picture, who has the best legs, okay? I'm just saying. Oh, I went back, I mean, I just think that my mom had the gams. And this is not irrelevant, because I think an image like that kept my dad going for four years, 44 months. He was, this girl was on his mind. Anyway, they came back, they got married, and here I am. But when you listen to, thank you, yes. I had nothing to do with it, really, you guys. I was not involved early on. I don't know how much you know about the process. It's a, 
I know there's a lot of software engineers. I know there's, there, there, are, um, there are stereotypical jokes made. You know, for a long time, my slacks didn't reach the floor. I know, I've been there. Yeah, and people recognize you guys at parties. That's right. Yeah, I've seen it, yeah. Hey, you're an engineer. Can you fix the blender? <laughs> yeah, just, yeah, yes. Uh, hold, the, hold the plug in the wall firmly and then put the blender under some cold running water. <laughs> see, that's only funny if you're scientifically literate, see? Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, they gave me this respect for science and my, uh, my dad called himself Ned Nye, boy scientist and all this stuff. So I set out years ago, everybody, to try to get young people excited about science so that we would have a new generation of scientifically literate people to become voters and taxpayers and dare I say it, change the world. Now, when we're here in California, I can't help but think about our former governor, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Now, I don't know if you saw this, I did a National Geographic show where I was in climate change denial. And uh, my therapist was Dr. Arnold Schwarzenegger, who, who explained, he said, you are suffering from climate change denial. And I said, climate change denial, that's not even a thing. And then he said, that is a thing. And I don't know if you guys saw it, but one thing led to another in the show, and I got to say on camera, I got to say to Arnold Schwarzenegger, I'll be back. Yes. <laughs> yes. It was hilarious. Sorry, you guys. All right. I just want to say, talking some more about me, that I've been after this climate change thing for a long time. That lower left book it was published in 1993. And I have a climate change demonstration in there. Then I did it on, I did several times on the Science Guy show. Then I did it on a show called Stuff Happens. I did it on the Eyes of Nye. I've been after this for a long time. Now you can easily say when we look at climate change as this global problem uh, that you could run in circles screaming, because there's nothing to be done. But oh no, my friends, there is so much to be done. And right here in California, at Stanford, we have an organization called the Solutions Project. I don't know how familiar you are with them, but they have done an analysis that you could provide 100% renewable electricity. When we're talking about energy, we're talking about electricity. Electricity is magical, as you all know. Uh, we could have 100% renewable electricity for everybody in the United States by 2050, and probably everybody in the world not long after that, if we just decided to do it. So you see here, they've broken down uh, the sources of renewable energy. Hang on. So there's onshore wind, that means like Altamont Pass or what have you, uh, solar panels for your house, residential, resident. Are there any professors here? But people who do presentations? I just want you to know when you do this, it doesn't help anything. <laughs> Nobody's getting any more out of it, you know, when you shake the beam. Oh, yeah, see, solar, yeah, that's, yeah, great. <laughs> I saw a presentation, oh, and he pointed out something. <laughs> uh, but the other thing we like to point out on my side of this is the number of jobs that would be created would be huge, or as we say, huge. Uh, you would just have all, over 300,000 jobs in California alone that would be based on renewable energy. We would just change our infrastructure. We would just change things. You could get 80% renewable by 2030 if we decided to do it and 100% by 2050 if we decided to do it. And as you may know, in California, we just have enormous wind resources. It's just all over the place. And then we have a lot of sun in California. Other places have tidal energy. Iowa now gets 25% of its electricity from the wind. Texas, Iowa, right on, right on. Love, I, I really do love Iowa. I have a, just a great time. And you guys, hey, by the way, Iowa makes 99% of the world's popcorn. So no diss in Iowa, all right? It's, <laughs> it's an important place. Uh, and Texas, Texas, oil people, 
They're all oil people. They get 10% of their electricity from the wind. That's huge, you guys. 10% is an enormous fraction. The longest journey starts with but a single step. Now, my grandfather was in World War I, and he put, he, uh, from that era, he was quite a horseman, apparently. He rode horses very well. And uh, he put a gas mask on himself, and he put a gas mask on his horse. And you guys, I don't know, are there horse people here? There are people with pets, right? I mean, what is the horse thinking here? I do not have a good feeling about this. He, his gas, he doesn't have eyes. It, it, the horse doesn't have eye protection, running into mustard gas or whatever. It's horrible. But you guys, this was the state of the art in 1917, 1918. This was how people conducted their warfare, was on horses. But 20 years later, nobody who was serious about conducting a war did it on a horse. The horseless carriage completely outmoded the horse. There's some mythic story of a Russian cavalry that was destroyed by German panzer tanks, but that aside, nobody who was serious about fighting a battle did it on a horse. And I don't know, Gan uh, Schoenschwer would mean, this is hard. <laughs> I, tried, I don't know if you've ever thrown a lariat from a horse. It's really hard, let alone trying to shoot somebody with a freaking, I mean, it's just, it's crazy. And uh, the horse is remarking, he's German, you know, uh, which would be, um, dude, really? Dude, you, really? There's a tank, dude. So everything changed. Everything changed in 20 years. So let's change everything. Let's get to work and change the world. Uh, you may not know this, but the president's mom was a riveter on B-17s in Wichita, Wichita, Kansas. And at that time, everything was about the war effort. Every post office, every poster, every billboard, every newspaper was about the war effort and how we're going to all pitch in and win the war. All the music was about winning the war. Look at those gobs doing their jobs, keeping the sea lanes free. Look at those guys winging, uh, those guys up in the skies winging to victory. I mean, this is all, everybody was into it, and they got her done. Uh, everybody was either fighting it or getting ready to fight it. And in five years, they changed the world. So we can do this. This is uh, me on top of my, so it's a picture of me, I'm over here, uh, on top of my house in Studio City. And for those of you, I know there's some people who aren't from the US, welcome. Uh, people who, from Iowa. Uh, Studio City, I'm just gonna explain. Studio City's in the city limits of Los Angeles, but it's like in the valley. It's like totally in the valley. And so there's a hill that separates Hollywood from the valley. Uh, ladies, are there, do you call other women dude? Do you? The first time I heard that was at my, uh, 10 years ago uh, in the valley, two gals walking on the street, dude. And so I said to her, dude, and like, dude. And so in the background, I have four kilowatts of solar panels. This time of year, I make way more electricity than I use. I would have more solar panels, but my neighbor's house uh, blocks my yard. And they travel a lot. And I've thought, you know, while they're out of town, I would just cut the top of their house off. <laughs> and then, you know, it would, I'd have power all, all winter. What? Easier to ask forgiveness than permission, people. Come on. <laughs> then uh, in the foreground is this dome. That's my solar tube dome. You, many of you are probably familiar. It has a lens, it has lenses in it, it has a Fresnel lens like, like these, these, those rings. So when the sun's low in the sky, light's directed down this super shiny tube on the box, it says, do not leave in the sun, fires may start. It's so much brighter than a conventional skylight. I still go into that room below and try to turn the light. It's been, it's been eight years. When did they have 2007? Yeah, it's going on uh, nine years. I still try to turn the light on. And then in the foreground is my solar hot water system. You guys, it's, it's a box with, with a pipe in it, a zigzag of pipe. 
It is not rocket surgery. It's just plumbing. I want somebody to go in the solar hot water business, for crying out loud. And there is a little controller that has software that is uh, used to make sure that the, the thing doesn't freeze in the wintertime and to optimize how much hot water you get so that it's a boost system. After it gets very warm, uh, this time of year, like yesterday, it gets really warm. And then if it needs to be boosted to um, 52 Celsius, 125 Fahrenheit, there's a little uh, uh, tankless hot, hot water heater. It adds a couple degrees. Anyway, this is in my backyard. And all this technology is old. I mean, this is, this, these uh, panels were put on nine years ago. Uh, but we could do this on industrial scales. And we're starting. And this is where you all come in. The key to the future is not just producing electricity. We have, I believe, the means to do that. We need to store it and move it around. And that's where your business is going to, dare I say it, change the world. So the most obvious thing is batteries. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever driven an electric car. Woo! But you'll never go back. Electric cars are just more fun. They're just nicer. They're quiet. People think I'm sitting at a desk when I talk on the phone hands-free. This means talk on the phone. That's the symbol. Uh, people think I'm sitting at a desk because the cars are so quiet. I've driven all of these, uh, not at the same time, that would be hard, but over the years. And what the idea is, as you guys may know, in California, for those of you who aren't hip to this, the idea is to have electrical storage in everybody's car, grid to vehicle storage, vehicle to grid use. So we would put electricity from our solar panels, our wind panels, and the existing nuclear power plants. We put all that into everybody's car, uh, and then during the day, we would take that electricity and use it for all the things we do. But by the way, if you can invent the better battery, you will get rich, crazy rich, like Bill Gates rich, like head of Ikea guy, rich. And there's proposals to have these, they really are called bipolar batteries, that's really what they're called. And then liquid metal batteries, where the, the Electrodes are molten antimony, uh, that's what next to tin on the periodic table, and molten uh, magnesium. And they stay liquid, like in the basement of a building like this, they'd be hot all the time. And just leave them hot night and day, it could be fantastic. But the real key, everybody, is moving this electricity around. That's where the future is. If we can find a way to move enormous amounts of electricity around the way we hand cell phone calls from cell to cell, we could change the world. And then we'd have, we'd have carbon nanotube power lines. I met Rick Smalley, who was one of the guys who got the Nobel Prize for discovering buckyballs, Buckminster fullerenes. And he said, it's like the electron falls asleep at one end of the tube, has a dream and wakes up at the other end, because it's quantum mechanics, it's some magical thing in physics, uh, then this could change the world. Now, along this line, I'll say that whatever we do to address climate change, whatever we do to address the earthquakes in Ecuador, the floods in Texas, terrorism, we have to be optimistic. You have to be optimistic. You have to always think you can do better, and the future will be better, or you won't get anything done. If you go into it, I, so I was a consultant to General Motors for a while. I was in a meeting and the guy said, we want to make our light trucks 50% recyclable. So, dude, dude, I, you know, it's like saying, I sure hope I get a C in this class. No, you want your trucks to be 100% recyclable. You want 100%. You want to do it perfectly. That's the goal, not halfway, for crying out loud. And so that is why I'm always so charmed and so enthusiastic and so excited about space exploration. Space exploration brings out the best in us. So this is a picture from our spacecraft, the Planetary Society's 
light sail spacecraft, which we flew last summer. Does anybody remember? Planetary Society, I love you, man, whoa, man. Thank you, yes. So we flew this spacecraft. It's so shiny and so low mass. How shiny, how low mass is it? That uh, it gets pushed through space by photons. But hold it, photons have no mass. How can they have momentum? They do. You can do it in classical physics or quantum mechanics, you get the same answer. But this solar sail spacecraft, a very modest spacecraft paid for by 46,000 people around the world who just think it's a cool thing, it is gonna democratize space. Once you get up on orbit, as they say, this spacecraft could take you to all sorts of extraordinary places in the solar system if you've got time. Uh, you, trade, uh, you trade rocket fuel for time because there's no fuel once it's up there. And Carl Sagan talked about this back in 1976. And the solar sail program was abandoned for uh, the space shuttle program under uh, this downsizing NASA to a uh, reasonable size, no longer fighting the Cold War. And it took 39 years for his vision to be realized, but it was realized. I was in Congressman's Congresswoman Senator, uh, I mean, Senator, Senator Barbara Mikulski's office in the year 2000. There's my predecessor, Lou Friedman. Yeah, which of these guys is an engineer? Yeah, Lou, I think that's you there in the gray suit. And then there's my best buddy, James Cameron. He's not really my best buddy. I met him, okay, I met him. But we were petitioning Ms. Mikulski to have a mission to Pluto. Well, she went for it. We had, we had 10,000 uh, postcards, people around the world who thought it was cool. She went for it, and uh, in 2006, we launched a mission to Pluto, and then last summer, as you may know, we got these extraordinary pictures. So they, the people who did this thought this would be cool. We know it's gonna take a long time, but we believe in it. They wrote postcards to the Planetary Society. We had a very small role in getting uh, the senator to uh, be aware of this, that people wanted this mission. And in her district is the Applied Physics Lab. It's like the Jet Propulsion Lab. Instead of being JPL, it's APL in her district, her state. And so it got funded there. And you don't hear that much about APL because there's a lot of military stuff and spy satellites that get built there. But, uh, it was successful and it had carried this optimism. They started this thing really in the 1990s. They got serious about funding it in the year 2000 and we got this picture 15 years later. That's just cool. And by the way, everybody, that spacecraft cost about $600 million, which you guys spent this morning on something. $600 million over 15 years just isn't that much money. And then uh, also this last October, everybody here was around when scientists really convinced themselves that there are recurring uh, lineae of water flowing on Mars. Mars has liquid water flowing on it every Martian summer. My friends, everywhere we find liquid water on Earth, everywhere we find, we find living things. So is there something alive on Mars? And wait, wait, there's more. Mars was hit with an impactor about 30, 3 billion years ago, a, a meteorite, asteroid, comet, something like that, that made this big <laughs> And these rocks were tossed off into space and they got in what's called a Hohmann orbit. And except it's in outer space, there's no sound, so it's just and they fell to Earth, and it is very reasonable. It's, not cr it's, it's extraordinary, but it's not crazy that you and I are descendants of microbes that where life started on Mars. Do, 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 And so uh, if we can go there with the right spacecraft and look around, we may make a discovery that would change the course of human history. And that discovery would not be by a single person. It would be as profound as the discoveries of Copernicus. You know, we can predict the motions of those objects in the sky if we think of the Earth going around the sun instead of the other way around. It would not be, 
it, it would be that profound. It would not be the same as when Galileo showed, hey, you know, the moon looks like a perfect circle, but it's full of craters. And it's not the only, we're not the only planet with things that go around it. Well, I'm sorry, Galileo, we have to imprison you. I'm sorry if you're going to run around saying that stuff. But anyway, those guys changed the world. They were single individuals. If we find life on Mars or evidence of life on Mars, say fossilized microbes of some sort, the discovery will be as profound, but it will not be made by a single person. It will be made by a society who thought this was a worthy investment of our intellect and treasure. And so we're all part of that. And I guarantee you that open source software is going to be, have a huge role in the success of future space missions. Now, if you go to Mars today, there are um, four rovers. Three of them carry what we call the Mars dial. This is a little test pattern for the cameras that uh, also serves as a sundial if you're standing in the right place. And it carries, each of these devices carries a message to the future. The first message to the future since uh, the Voyager missions left Earth in 1977, back in the disco era. And if you go to the Smithsonian, the Mars exhibit's being rebuilt, but uh, something like this will be back in place soon. There's the flight spare of the Mars dial. And around the edge, in very, very small letters, it says, we built the spacecraft in 2011. It arrived here in 2012 to look for signs of water and life, to learn about Mars past, prepare for our future. And then it says in very small letters, to those who visit here, we wish a safe journey and the joy of discovery. And that, my friends, is the essence of science. That is why we do science experiments. That is why we explore. That is why we write new software and new ways of doing things, is to make discoveries. Our ancestors, who did not feel the joy of discovery, are not really our ancestors. They got outcompeted by the other tribes and families that went over the hill to see what was going on, to find new places to live and new resources to, uh, to use. This idea that somebody's going to visit Mars and have a safe journey and feel the joy of discovery is optimistic. It may not be till 2037. We believe that we could have humans orbiting Mars without increasing the NASA budget, by the way, by 2033, and then they could land two or four years later. This is optimistic that somebody will be there to look at this thing. And humankind will be thriving, and we will be writing software, and the world will be better for billions of people. Now, uh, last year, Carl Sagan's papers were submitted to the Library of Congress. And on that same day, the Cassini spacecraft mission, uh, team uh, submitted this picture. This is a picture of the South Pole of Saturn, or what humans call the South Pole of Saturn. I don't know what the Saturnians call it, if there are any of them. Uh, but it's extraordinary. The rings are lit by sunlight, and you're looking up from below. But it's also a picture of the Earth. The Earth is right here. And that's why this picture is so extraordinary. You get a spacecraft launched in 1997 out there and take a picture in 2014 is a really difficult thing. But they did. We did. And uh, it's just really something to think about the Earth being this one dot in this extraordinary image. Now, if we could fly up there 100,000 kilometers, which in space travel is nothing, day at the office, then here's the same view of the same place in space. Uh, now, the iris is different because you don't have the bright rings making you uh, stop down for that. Uh, do you see the Earth? you see us? We're right there. There's the Earth. Now, when I was a kid, Mrs. Cochran, my third grade teacher, told us there are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on the beach. And I remember thinking, I mean, I wouldn't have expressed it this way, but Mrs. Cochran, are you high? Have you ever been to a beach, lady? For crying out loud, there is nothing but sand. And I, um, I grew up back east, and we used to go on vacation in Delaware. I would stand on the shore of Delaware, which is a state, 
the first state, the diamond state, uh, and you look that way, 1,500 miles, 1,500 nautical miles in each direction, there's nothing but sand. There's just sand. You look behind you, there's more sand. The tide goes out and there's sand. And you're a little boy. All you do is dig holes. You just, just dig holes in the sand. And there's more sand. As deep as you can dig, there's sand. And I remember thinking, there's no way there are that many stars. That is impossible. Well, get this, people. There are about 100 times more stars, 100 times as many stars that we can observe as there are grains of sand on Earth. In other words, Mrs. Cochran was way off. She was, but I mean, well-intending, but way off. And I, I was a kid, and, and you know, this was a, the space program. We didn't have the International Space Station, but there were people flying in space. I remember thinking, if I could wave my arms, you know, especially, especially at sunset, where the, the sun would be coming over the edge of the Earth, they could see me there, little Bill. Well, when you look at this picture, I hope you realize, no, no way. They're not going to see you, Bill. Wave your arms, if you will, to your blue in the face. They're not going to see you. So I started feeling pretty insignificant. I started feeling, well, really, I'm no different from a grain of sand, you know, in this cosmic perspective. I'm just, I'm just a grain. I'm just a speck with all these little specks of sand. And then the earth, when you look at it like this, is just another speck. I'm a speck standing on a bunch of specks, which is part of a speck which are part of a speck, which is orbiting the sun, which is not all that remarkable. It's interesting, but there's billions of them. I'm a speck on a speck, orbiting a speck with a bunch of other specks in specklessness. I am nothing. I suck. But my, with my brain, which is just this big, in the case of at least one of my old bosses, Quite a bit smaller, it's quite a bit smaller. But with your brain, you can know all of this. With your brain, we can know our place in space. We can see what's happening to the Earth. We can compare our planet to other planets. We can know the cosmos. We can be optimistic about the future, and we can, dare I say it, my friends, change the world. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Let's go. Let's get her done. Oh, we love that song. Jim, yes. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. So uh, we, we wanted to present you with a little gift. I don't know if they have the, the, the picture up from last year, but last year, if you were here, uh, we think we told you we had uh, Steve Wozniak up. Yes, yes, and, with and we the gave watch, him a, the crazy a little gift, and, and we, we have uh, baseball jerseys that, despite everybody picking on marketing, you know, we have a budget hey, just I love for shirts. Sure. No, I love marketing. And so we gave Wozniak uh, the square root of negative one. Oh. He loved it. And so Who wouldn't? We'd, we'd like to offer you your own jersey. Oh, you may cool. be called into service at some point. God, you know I love baseball. Well, you might love the What's number What's my two. number? Infinity. Yes. Yes. Where does he play? Where does he play? Well, God, anywhere, any, anywhere you want. I was going to so say. Wear it with pride. We don't know what the event might be that you're called upon. We're hoping it's a science fair. Yes. We'll, we'll really well, kick some yes. butt there. But, thank um, you, man. Thank you this very much really, for spending time with us. It was a wonderful talk. Everybody, go out the science now, guy. Do we have time for questions? Do, do we, we have, have five minutes? Yeah, we, have, we have five minutes left. Do we want to do questions? Does anybody have a question? We set some mics up in the aisle, and we'd love to take some, well, he, we, he would love to take some questions. But Any if questions? If my talk was so compelling that I've answered all of your questions, it's no coincidence that I was given infinity. That's it. I've, here he is. Yes. Yeah, so uh, it's kind of tangential to your talk, which is very good, by the way. But I've, I've always wanted to ask you, uh, I, I looked at Dr. Zubin's work, if you familiar with that, the Mars Direct Plan? Yes. And I, I was wondering what your opinion of that was, because I know with the Planetary Society, you're like a big fan of you know, robots going out there and stuff like that, but when you look at that plan, which is very optimistic, if slightly dangerous, um, you know, he says you can do it in 10 years, which makes a lot of sense from a political perspective and all that sort of stuff. And when you look at that and then compare it to NASA saying 2030, you're like, wow, what's taking so long? And I just kind so, of curious to your thoughts. So, if you guys don't know, there's a guy named Mark Zubrin who's uh, been, he's the head of something called the Mars Society, and they want to go to Mars in uh, less than 10 years, and he has a budget and so on. But here's what, here's the problem. It's not the Cold War. So, when, uh, when the United States was competing with the former Soviet Union, 
to put a human on the moon, which was a result of John Kennedy. President Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon in this decade, this decade. Uh, and he said that. And then when he was assassinated, it was, you can ask anybody in the, in the space community, like, you couldn't cancel it. Like, it was a tribute to this very popular president. And so the United States was successful, but the budget at that time for NASA was 4% of the federal budget, 4%. Today, it's 0.4%. It's literally almost exactly a, ten a tenth of what it once was. So the political reality is that it's, you're very unlikely you're going to be able to pull that off. And so when you, don't, when you go into it always hoping that somebody's going to see your genius and 10 timesify the space budget, it's not going to happen. And as I like to say at the Planetary Society, for those of you who occasionally miss an issue of Space News, I was quoted, that's really a real publication called Space News. What's that publication about? Oh, the news of space. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, I say at the Planetary Society, we are not crazy. That's what I say. So the technical problems are quite difficult, but every bit as important are the political problems. You have to satisfy the people from California who've got the Jet Propulsion Lab, people in Mississippi who test the rocket engines, people in Alabama who assemble the rockets, people in Florida who launch them. You have to, people in Ohio who do the zero gravity testing, you have to take care of everybody. And this, so that's why we say 2033, without increasing the NASA budget, we could do it a lot faster if we wanted. And my friends, if the Mars 2020 rover, which is scheduled to launch in 2020, is allowed to drive up to one of those crater walls where the water's coming out and finds evidence of life, like a lot of methane or something bubbling or some extraordinary thing, people would go to Mars like that. We would be on the way to Mars like that. And that, the planetary science budget, everybody, is one and a half billion dollars a year. It's 9% of 0.4%. It's 9% of the NASA budget. So uh, we encourage you all to join the Planetary Society because we advocate for planetary missions. That's a great question, man. Thank you. Thank Somebody you. was standing here. Oh, here. Yes. Is this on? Oh, yeah, good. Yeah. So the, the Drake equation. The Drake equation. equation. Yes. I love you guys. To imply yes. that there's a lot of intelligent life that came up in the universe. Sure. And a lot of... What about here? <laughs> exactly. And a lot of um, pessimistic interpretations of the fact that we don't see any, uh, you know, tend to lead people to the conclusion that intelligence tends to destroy itself before it becomes visible on the galactic scale. I have a, a theory to run by you. It's an honor to engage with you in this. Um, I have a theory that in reality, maybe we are prey not by destruction, but by navel gazing. And that the innovations by what? that by navel, navel gazing. gazing, yes, the innovations that we see in virtual reality maybe means that um, intelligence tends to get distracted once they invent those I'm technologies. I'm sorry, what? What did you say? So, <laughs> what we're seeing with the um, the dawn of the virtual reality era with Oculus Rift and it is all Magic that Leap I gotta say, yeah, Hololens. Do you think it's possible that the reason that we don't see intelligent life in the universe is because all of the intelligences eventually just withdrew into themselves no. and used virtual I, reality no, I don't think the so. world? No. Have you seen the deep space network, everybody? There's these enormous freaking radio dishes that just we point at the sky. And just because it's cool. No, just because humankind wants to know what's going on. And by the way, if you ever go to one of these things, if you go to Goldstone or Canberra, Australia, or whatever, it, on a clear night, like right now, like this week, there's Jupiter. You can see Jupiter in the sky, very bright object, bright, brighter than the stars. And the telescope's pointed right at it. It like totally freaks me out. But it's that simple. You just point it up there, and then we're listening to the, the atmospheric friction on Jupiter. It's just amazing. No, I don't think we're going to be navel-gazing. I will say, as a mechanical engineer, I will say that there is some evidence that other branches of engineering get really into it and make things really complicated. I'm not saying you, no, I'm no, no, not, but I'm just saying. 
that, no, but you can also do this. I know, but can, can we get it to, uh, I wanted the car to just start. I think it's great that, you know, it's, does the, it makes breakfast. But so, uh, no, I don't think that's a problem. I really don't think that's a problem. But, I, you know, we as grown-ups, everybody, Socrates complained about kids today. So if you get into that, you can make yourself, these kids today, they're all playing video games. They're not looking at the heaven, but some of them are. Some of them are looking at the sky. Yes, sir, and then sir, yes. Quick question. Does anything happen by chance? Does everything happen by chance? Anything. Does anything happen by chance? Uh, well, as they say, there's a reason for everything, but that reason is usually physics. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know. It sure seems like it. Seems like there's a lot of things that happen by chance. Were the ancient dinosaurs destroyed by chance? Or was there some intelligence directing uh, an asteroid or impact or... Uh, it doesn't seem like it. Was dark matter involved? And the Earth's going through the dark matter disk and that made more uh, asteroids come down every 37 million years? Could be. I don't know. I think a lot of things happen by chance. And as Richard Feynman said, it all goes back to the two-slit experiment, for those of you into uh, quantum electrodynamics. And so apparently things do happen at random. Yes? So in addressing a room full of developers, software engineers. Woo! My people! How can we uh, contribute more than just our, obviously, our, our disposable income, but how can we uh, contribute our talents as well to the Planetary Society or... Oh, Planetary Society, yes! Or, or to the, you know, the quest of, of human exploration at, at, at large, for example. You know. Well, what we want to do is lower the cost of getting to low Earth orbit. That's a, if you're talking about space exploration. And uh, that's happening through investments, you know, People talk about SpaceX, and they should, and Blue Origins, Jeff Bezos, is kind of, and they should. But keep in mind that those or companies are doing business with NASA and, other, and space agencies around the world and communication satellites especially. The amount of money that goes into communication satellites is huge, huge. And so what can you do? What we want, you guys, is to be able to share information for everybody in the world. There's three things we want for everyone in the world. We want... Uh, clean water, reliable electricity. So not only do you have electricity, but you can count on it. And we want access to what nowadays we call the internet, the information superhighway. We want those three things for everyone on earth. And uh, this will enable us to educate people, especially girls and women. And when we educate girls and women, the uh, the birth rate goes down, and the kids that are born are uh, in smaller families, so they receive better care, and they are more successful. And so this is the way we are going to ultimately uh, have more, what we want is more with less. We will have higher quality of life for everyone using less of the Earth's resources. So to me, you guys are, this is it. Providing the internet to every, or the future equivalent, whatever it comes to be called, uh, to everyone in the world, that's where you guys come in. And it's so easy for me to imagine uh, in remote villages, let's say in Africa, um, people are not connected to the electric grid. They're too remote, and plus it's a hassle. Stringing transmission lines all over a huge continent instead uh, people will be able, will have solar power locally or wind power locally. They'll have local electrical storage somehow, batteries, your amazing ideas. And then they'll be on the internet with clocks coordinated with satellites, with space assets. I mean, that's so easy for me to imagine that everyone in the world will be able to get an answer to any question in virtually any language thanks to you guys. I mean, I just remember the other day I looked up the arc cosine of something. It was instant, I mean, before I could hit enter, it was, it was like 400 websites with the same answer, the arc cosine or whatever. And so that's because you guys have created open source software. And I thank you, thank you very much, I get it. Uh, and then uh, you can walk, I mean, people can't tell, they don't know which side of the street they're on till they take out the phone and look at the map to see where they are. And that information comes from space. We're so close and the phones are thinner and uh, the batteries last longer because we're working the problem from both ends. We're making better batteries, better 
uh, circuits and better, more efficient software, right? So I, I, uh, a pretty good friend of mine is, was employee 107 at Microsoft. And he talked all the time about getting, trying to reduce the uh, execution time to 40 microseconds. Is that the right number? 40 microseconds. That was like their uh, number they all shot for. No, you guys are part of this future. You guys are it. And I really appreciate you all including me. This is great. Thank you, Jim. Are we done? Thanks a lot, you guys. Let's Thank change you, the world. Thank you.